I got a C in one course. A C and C is practically like fail. Uh, it just got into my mind at a point. I was like, damn it, I'm gonna go to grad school and also become a professor. I mean, reading about all these Nobel Prize winners, and then usually I look at them, none of them is black. I mean, we have black Nobel Prize winners, but most of them are in peace and literature. But in my final year, I got to join this uh, very famous professor in our department, Professor Richard Tia, who was very, very inspiring. And he, working with him, he would always be talking about winning a Nobel Prize. His students are going to win a Nobel Prize for him and share the money with him. I mean, in the beginning, that's the most like euphoric and rewarding parts of maybe doing research. It wasn't easy trying to make this transition. Many people say that it's the most consequential decisions you can make in your graduate school. Person you decide to work with. The most rewarding moments are just that the publications, and then I've also been given a couple of awards over the years, so it's helped. It makes me happy to be much more effective and move faster in grad school is for collaborate. So you just work with them and you're about to finish. Like it's, it will be an, a missed opportunity for them to just let you go. Like, what would you do differently if you were in your position? I would do. All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone, my name is Joseph Rippon and welcome to the second episode of Couch Talk. Today we are going to be talking about something very interesting. We are talking about a letter to a young scientist or a young graduate student. And today I have one of my friends again here to talk or discuss with me about his experiences in grad school. And he is one of the most prolific um, graduate students that I know in our batch because he has a couple of papers in JAXA and he also has um, a lot of papers in well-known journals like Analchem. And I think this makes him a very good person to discuss about how to be a successful graduate student, um, a perspective from someone who is in faith here. So today um, I have a guest here. I'll allow him to introduce himself. So who are you? Okay, who am I? All right, um, so like you already said, um, we are mates. We came here on the same batch. We are from the same batch of graduate students. And my name is Shiraz. And um, I am a graduate student at Wayne State University here in Michigan. And um, I am yeah, in chemistry, um, if that wasn't really obvious. And uh, my research is mostly about um, cancer imaging. OK, so <laughs> there is something called MRI. And I'm sure most of you have heard about it. You have um, some sickness, so they put you under this machine, then you lie down inside the machine and they try to do imaging and see if there is an issue somewhere. So my research is focused on making some contrast agents, that is some medicines that you can take into your system or they can inject into you. And then if they perform the MRI on you, the images are going to be very, very clear so that doctors can make a better decisions on the treatments that they can choose for you. So that's basically what I'm working on. And mostly I'm not really doing chemistry. I'm mostly doing engineering stuff, building stuff that can be used to produce these contrast agents. So yeah. it's interesting that um, even though you're in a chemistry department, you're really not doing chemistry. Can you talk about your experience with that um, since you did um, your undergrad in chemistry from Ghana, right? Um, how was the experience like transitioning from doing chemistry to something more engineering, right? Okay, so um, the thing is, yeah, my undergrad was in chemistry, but computational chemi like my final year project was in computational chemistry, so I didn't really have a lot of experience in doing wet chemistry in the lab. And so when I came here and then I was presented with this opportunity to work in chemistry stuff, but not really on the chemicals aspects, it's, it was something that was really exciting to me. But it wasn't easy trying to make this transition from like not doing things with your hands to suddenly having to do everything with your hands. Okay, so, but the good thing is that I chose a very good advisor. Like I was lucky to end up with a very good advisor. And so I, he was very hands-on. So he will, instead of just telling you do this, he will actually do it and show you how to do it. And once he does it and you see it, able to do stuff on your own so with time things just become natural um, because you begin to yes if you want to build something you think about the things you've built before and then you see how you can put it together or apply it to what you want to build now so um, that's basically how I did my transition and um, now I cannot imagine life otherwise I like it that way 
Right. So before we go on more about your graduate school, mm-hmm. I wanted to circle back to your inspiration to why you actually came to grad school in the first place. What inspired you to come to grad school? Okay. So initially, I wasn't thinking about it at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, even when I was an undergrad, I wasn't really serious with my studies. Not because um um not because it was intentional, but because I things were just boring to me most of the time. But in my final year, I got to join this very famous professor in our department, Professor Richard Tia, who was very, very inspiring. And he, working with him, he would always be talking about winning a Nobel Prize. His students are going to win a Nobel Prize for him and share the money with, with him. And so uh, it just got into my mind at a point I was like, damn it i'm gonna go to grad school and also become a professor i mean reading about all these nobel prize winners and then usually i look at them none of them is black i mean we have black nobel prize winners but mm-hmm. most of them are in peace and literature mm-hmm. no science i was like hmm, what if i'll be that person so that's why i came to grad school and um i mean i just decided to just write, write to random professors and i mean maybe we'll get to this later on but um it was it's a process on its own yeah and i'm sure maybe there is another episode about this um, on this channel on how to get into um, the graduate school of your choice in the previous episode actually yeah. yeah so that's basically um how i decided to come to graduate school it was basically because of my undergrad um research supervisor yeah, other than that i would have just finished and go back to my hometown and get into farming or I knew someone working at uh, Ghana Water Works or whatever. I was thinking about going there to work. That's good. So that's nice. Looks like you were inspired by your previous um, advisor in undergrad. And God bless the person, whoever he is. And um, one thing I want to ask about is, looking back to your time in grad school Mm -hmm. so far, what are some of the most rewarding times that you experience in grad school? Okay, I think it's, I mean, it's it's basically just the satisfaction you get after having your paper published. Like, you just hear that your paper has been accepted for publication. That is, I mean, in the beginning, that's the most, like, euphoric and rewarding parts of maybe doing research. Which which paper particularly was the best for you? For me, the best paper for me was paper I wasn't a first author on, but I built equipment that was used for it. And Mm -hmm. it's very similar. I don't, I, I mean, I think it's going to have a lot of impact, but not now, but in the future. And it was basically about creating lasers with radio waves. So lasers, as we know them right now, are created mostly with either microwave radiation or I don't want to get into the details of it, but this was uh, us creating a laser using radio waves, NMR. So we call them NMR lasers. And instead of calling it laser, we take out the L and then we now call it lasers, which is radio amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So we have nucleus of some molecules just emitting radio waves continuously for several minutes. And this was something that was demonstrated on carbon nuclei first using the equipment that we built in our lab. So this was very exciting for me because I mean, I felt like I've also made some contribution to science or to human development. Yeah. But the most rewarding moments are just that, the publications. And then I've also been given a couple of awards over the years. So it's, it makes me happy. Some, some of these awards come with money. So it's, that's the most rewarding part of, of it all. Yeah. All right. That's, that's nice to hear that you've won awards and mm-hmm. you've actually um, experienced um, a lot of joys from getting papers published. That's really nice to hear. But then let's look on the other side of it, right? What has been some of your most challenging um, times in grad school or obstacles that you faced while in grad school? I think the most challenging part 
It was my first year in grad school. And I think that you are a witness to this. <laughs> I got a C in one course. A C. And C is practically like fail. I mean, B minus is fail in grad school. Mm-hmm. Not stock of C. Mm-hmm. I got a C in the course. And this brought my CWA down. So in my school, when you come, they give you a stipend, a contract that they are going to pay you this amount every year. And this is divided into months and weeks that you, you receive every two weeks as a paycheck. And apart from that money, my department also adds some money to that. And so when my CWA dropped below a certain limit, they took off that money, which means that I had to depend on just the, the, the funding from the graduate school. And that wasn't enough. I mean, it was enough, but it wasn't more than adequate okay so once they took this money off and i realized that what what is happening to me i mean i need to set up i mean i came all the way from ghana i can't come all the way from ghana to come here and be failing i mean i have to be serious and this was not mostly i'm not saying it wasn't my fault but it was mostly because there were so many things going on with me at that time. I was severely sick. I mean, like, if you see me walking around, you wouldn't know I'm sick, but I was always in some sort of pain, maybe in the middle of the night, and had all sorts of things to worry about. This was one of the things that was very challenging for me in the first year. And so once I was able to pass through this stage and um, got into research and Everything moving on. I mean, this uh, we started this this graduate school in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, can you speak more about that? I mean, how was the effect of pandemic? Um, yeah, you know, yeah, on your education. Yeah, because um, this pandemic really derailed the process for most graduate students. It really sent a lot of people back. But um, one thing that kept me afloat was I had a supervisor who could let you still do stuff, lab stuff while you're at home. So he practically would bring things from the lab to my home. I'm not my home, my apartment. And then I'll be working on it and making some small progress. Mm -hmm. But up till now, I can feel the effect. I mean, he keeps on saying, well, if you started working in my lab in person, like during that first year, that's that second year where the pandemic was happening. Like some things we are doing now, we would have done it a long time ago. Okay, so this pandemic really had an effect on all of us. I mean, it delayed a lot of stuff. Okay, and some things I was going to, I was supposed to work on. Those we had to even change the trajectory of my projects and all of that. So I think it had a, a very large impact on most people, and that's that includes me. So apart from the you know the work side of how it affected you, did they have any emotional or you know, mental effects as well on you. Because I, I, I do know most most people complained about that too as well. How was that for you? And how did you go about, you know, dealing with it? And how do people deal with mental health too during yeah, the course so of their Yeah, so personally, the way this affected me mentally was not mostly because of the pandemic itself, because mm-hmm. I... I don't, for some reason, I always believe that this thing was being um, exaggerated. And if we just stayed home and just wear our masks and when it's time for vaccination, we get vaccinated, things are going to be okay. But I had relatives at home who were very worried about me. And kept calling because they hear about deaths in the US. They were so scared. And so they would call me and then my mom is also very religious all the time. She's she be praying on the phone and all of that. So uh, it, it made me feel sad to some extent. And um, because I don't like it when knowing that I don't like it when I, when I learned that my mom is sad or worried about me. She's a very paranoid person. And if she's worried about you, she gets sick herself. So because of that, I wasn't in my right state of mind during the pandemic myself. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I see a lot of people just staying home and not con- interacting with people. It affected them a lot, especially undergraduate students. And I could see during that time, the students kind of students who were teaching online and then later on transition to in-person, you could see that 
I mean, these are just new students. These are, they are just coming to college to experience the college life for the first time. And this is happening. You could see that it has a very, very high impact on people's mental health. But, I mean, we navigated it, so now it doesn't really matter. Right. That's, that's nice to hear. So, I mean, we go to, we are going to like a, one of the most pivotal parts of the conversation, which has to do with how, what would be the advice that you give to new students or new grad students who are entering into academia? What would be the advice to adjusting from undergrad life or sometimes master's life actually into a PhD program? What would be your advice for them and what would you do differently if you were in your position? Okay, so adjusting from undergrad, I would say to just not see PhD as just um, another undergrad, but maybe more intense academics. I mean, I always heard people complaining about PhD. I read online on Quora and all of that. And so I was like, hmm, I'm not going to listen to people. So I, I didn't come to uh, the PhD program with that mindset. So mm -hmm. I was still just relaxed like I was an undergrad. And like I said, coupled with the fact that I was even like academic. But if I was going to start again, especially because I'm doing the PhD in another country, I would just forget about trying to do exploration for the first few months. I will just focus on being grounded in school in my courses and forget about everything is the first semester mm -hmm. and then this will give me some self-confidence and some something to stand on then maybe the second semester or even the second year i can try to explore the new environment the country and all of that this is not to say that you, you shouldn't have some time for yourself during the first year of your studies but this is the most difficult part. You just, if you just focus and, and push it through, then you can, you can relax and while you are doing your research, have your, um, peace of mind or have your fun, go around and explore the country and all of that. But for those of us, for example, who move from Africa, you are under the, some pressure in your head to go around and have fun, take pictures and show people that you have moved to America. But I don't think it's ideal to do that at that stage i mean i wouldn't do that if i started i mean i didn't really do that much but i still feel like i wasted a lot of time on some things i could have just waited and do later on i mean that's basically what i was saying put a lot of effort into my academics and do much more serious planning like plant things and follow through the plans i didn't really have a structured plan for my first year of peace like first semester but i guess using the calendar is very important and just boiling down to the most important things that you have to do such as you know that you have to teach that should be your priority to, to, to keep getting funded you know that you have to pass your courses you know that you have to do rotations in labs but you have to rank this in some order the most important thing is the first two, the funding and your academics. Once you are, you put this at the top of your priorities, then every other thing comes second. And then so after some time, you can just adjust things and then things will just flow along. So if I wanted to start again, that's basically what I would do. Something I would tell people, like for those who are, let's say, choosing a like, you've come to grad school and you are going to choose an advisor or you are coming to join a lab, I would say the most important thing, I wouldn't say it's, it's like your passion, okay? So perhaps you are interested in organic chemistry, okay? But once you are in the organic chemistry, your biggest priority should now not just be maybe the niche research area, but it should be the person you are working with. I think this is very important. And many people say that it's the most consequential decisions you can make in your graduate school, the person you decide to work with. So once you choose a good professor, then you probably have a good experience. If you end up with a bad one, then probably this is going to be like 
I mean, I've seen people jump, like colleagues, I've seen them jump from, like, since we moved here, three schools. And then there are colleagues that I know that started graduate school before us, and they have jumped to different schools, and now they are even starting PhD for the first year again, just because they made the mistakes of joining the wrong supervisors. So this is very important. So don't just come with the mindset, okay, I see that this professor has a lot of funding, he has a lot of money, so I have to work with him. Funding is important, but how do you feel working with that person? And I know this is hard to decide. You cannot just know this by looking at that person. And sometimes you talk to the lab mates and just to see the feel of the environment or the, um, the situation in the lab. But at the end of the day, I think it is also just that there is some a lot of a little bit of luck in it, and because you cannot just know people outright, but you just have to gauge it, and based on your few interactions with the person, if you can read them very very well, then you can decide that well, this is someone that I can relate with. Now, if you cannot just just make this um, decision or just make this um, um, like find out this just by talking to the person and seeing their smile or how they respond to you i think the best thing is to just be like blunt and ask the right questions like what do you expect of your of your students how many papers do you expect them to publish and um um how do you want them to show up in the lab like the time they come in early in the morning how long do how they, long they, they stay do they work on weekend or are they just looking for progress on the work that they've given you to do? Right. This is very important if you are coming out to start in graduate school. And I would say I was lucky. And so for for any much of much of the progress I've made, I would say it, it can be attributed to having selected a, a good advisor and um, our personalities seem to match. So, um, it makes things easier yeah right so about that i mean you mentioned a couple of staffs which i took note of you mentioned the fact that you need to choose an advisor which is very important your passion is also very important as well but one thing i want to know is like in choosing for instance an advisor right um how you how what are the strategies that you used right to figure out what kind of advisor you wanted to work with. You know, I know some advisors like to work with you one-on-one, -on -one. like for instance, almost every day or every three days, he wants to monitor you to work with you. And then there are some advisors that leave you to do your own kind of work, right? I mean, how were you able to figure out an advisor that works best with you? Okay, so so when we when we come, in our department, for example, when we come, we are allowed to do some rotations around and then see the feel of the labs. But um, um, the labs that I actually had intentions of joining, I rotated. And for most of those that I rotated, I wasn't really interested. It was just one of them that was I was really, really interested in. And But what I found was that, I mean, this professor was also teaching a course that I was taking and then um, I was like well this is a very very interesting field but uh, it looks like I, need, I still have a lot of learning care to do if I want to do well in this field and I decided that well um, it also looks like a lot of students want to join this lab okay what are my chances of him choosing me okay and so I had to consider other options. So I decided to look at other avenues, other professors in the department. So there was a graduate research symposium. I went there and then I was listening to the professor, uh, the research of the various groups. And then I came to um, this professor who was presenting his the research from his group. And then he was all smiles, just laughing. And then when I asked him a question, he's just, it's like, good question good question and <laughs> great and then he's like the enthusiasm the way he's answering the question then you see that this guy i mean he's 
I mean, even if he's not interested in me, at least he's very interested in his research. Okay, so maybe if I love his research like he loves it, then we will be okay with each other. Okay, so I told him that, well, I'm going to come and talk to you in your lab. Uh, sorry, in your office after this. Then I went to talk to him and um, he was just a very nice person. Like, you could just see it posing out of him. Like, you like you ask him a question, it's not going to make it look like, oh, this is something you should know. Or he will not just answer it like in an expect way. Like, well, I know it, so I'll just tell you what it is. He would try to actually bring in the basics and just explain. Then you see that this person is really interested in making you understand what is going on. So I was like, I think that I would want to work with this guy. And apart from that, the things he was, he was doing also, also looked cool. And this was my first time seeing it. I mean, I had never thought of working in that direction. Like when I was, for example, in um, in the college, whenever NMR was not my one of my favorite subjects, not at all. But his research was based on this concept of NMR. So just talking to him and seeing that he was nice, I decided, well, I'm this person is going to be someone, maybe let me add him to my list of options that I want to work with. And so I just decided to come around, look at what he's doing in his lab. And then the people in the lab, I talked to them and then they were like, you wouldn't hear a negative thing. I mean, negative stuff you would not. Not all of them were praises of him. So I was like, well, they all like him like this. I'm also going to like him. So I just decided that, okay, this is the lab I'm going to join. So I made up my mind and I have never looked back. Yeah. Great. That's, that's really nice to hear. <laughs> so now um, I wanted to talk about what are some of the strategies that you, you know, used. I think you, you hinted on some of them, but I want you to respond on some of the strategies that you use both in coursework and also in research that made you an effective um, you know, scientist or a graduate student, especially in your first year and, and when you actually started doing research, somewhere in second year or somewhere later part of your first year. What was the techniques and skills that you felt like were very instrumental to your success in graduate school? Yeah, so I think that for me, what was um, instrumental for me was, it's not, it's not like, I think it's just something that is in me. So for example, I, I always want to know the reason why at the deeper level, what is really happening? Why is this this way? Instead of like just, university. yeah, instead of just being told this is what is happening, then I will just take it. Take it like that. So I would always, so, I asked this my professor sent me some list of papers that I, I needed to read to understand his field. Then after that, I would just went into a rabbit hole, like just reading more and more and more and more about the field. And then one one thing that always makes me like our strategy that I always take to understand stuff is I try to do like oh okay I'm um I know more about it than anybody so I'm trying to explain it to everybody so. I'll usually be posting about something that I'm obsessed with for that week. I'll be posting about it on social media, on Facebook, on WhatsApp. And so one, the more I read about this, then I go and ask him more questions. And some of them are dumb questions, but he will just answer them right away. And then he saw that I was asking too many questions. So if I ask, then he'll say, oh, if you're interested, I can let you do this. And then sometimes he'll be like, since you are asking, then you should do this. Since you're asking, and then... So at a time that maybe my colleagues were not really running some experiments or like making some um, really serious progress in the lab, he really already put me on some, some experiments, like some things to do. And instead of just leaving me to it, he will actually come and help in person and then go to his office and I say, if I have any issues, I should come and see him. And so I think what really helped me was just that, I mean, one, I just, I just asked for more work from my advisor and do them because if 
once I ask for it and I cannot do it, he usually would offer to help. And once you have a hands-on advisor or an advisor who is very willing to help, and usually they will be willing to help if they see that you have some eagerness or you really Passion. want to do something. So they, they because they themselves, they also want to push out papers. They want to publish. They have written money. You like the ideas yeah. you're bringing to. Yeah. They've written money to get grants, so they need to publish papers to show for it. Mm-hmm. So, and once one I- one idea works, and then it just builds on from there. And usually, when things are working, I mean, they just start; to, they keep on just working. I mean, maybe of course, eventually, it will hit a roadblock. But once something works in one direction, then it's easier to push things in that direction more further and further and further. I think. Me, for me, that's what really helped. Just um, once we published my first paper, which was on building some equipment for um, perhydrogen production. And he was just like, well, okay, then it looks like I, I see that you are really good at this. So any other thing that has to do with building equipment or stuff, I'm going to put you on it. And that's what happened. So you found your niche in your lab. Yeah. Because you started going to your professor asking questions exactly searching more about the concept that you really wanted to understand exactly and basically fooling your passion in that sense yeah. so your professor became very interested also in your ideas and pushing you into projects yeah. that he thinks yeah. will, will help you yeah. right? and in, and the other thing is that for example i i didn't really work by maybe time schedule like it's after five i'm going home no I mean, once I got interested in something and I was working on it, if I can even be in the lab till like 12 a.m., I don't really care. I'm going to keep on working on this stuff because it's, I just, once I get into it, I just feel like, no, this is something, if I leave it, maybe. You lose that interest. Yeah, exactly. So I'll just keep on pushing. So, and then he would see that, I mean, I stay past the, 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 the time and so if I don't come early in the morning he's not going to bother and even if I don't show up in the lab he's not going to be mad about it because he knows that it's probably because of something important that I'm not in the lab and if I really have to be doing something important in the lab then I will be there because so because of that I'm big I also would work sometimes on weekends that is usually on Saturdays because when I feel like, when I feel like I am not supposed to be there, but I'm there, I think I tend to be more productive. This is just my experience. So, I mean, I don't know if putting in that weekend helped, but I think to some extent it did help. And um, that's um, basically, I think anything I would say I did on my part to be successful in terms of uh, publishing or just um yeah publishing research and papers but for the most part i think it's just um your drive your curiosity yeah, and, and your, your having a good advice advice as well yeah right. so it's very important to end up with a good advice and serious yeah right so i think one thing that people normally um do not pay attention to so much when they come to grad school is actually collaborating with other people right mm-hmm. so what was what did you do to drive this um to basically be able to collaborate with uh, um, other people or network yeah. with other people yeah. what was your efforts in that respect yeah so I, it's a very good that you asked this question it's a very interesting one because i think yeah this is something i i skipped and i didn't mention i think one way to to be much more effective and move faster in grad school is for collaboration is to collaborate so instead of so for example in the lab instead of um if there is something that i am doing and one part of it depends on some other students projects work instead of me doing it we actually let the student do it mm-hmm. or whoever that person is they will do it everything that has to do with it maybe data analysis on that part of it they will do it and then the person gets brought on onto the paper. I mean, they've contributed. So if the person has contributed in a way, why don't you put the person on the paper? And then 
me for example i would help on on many projects in the lab so i was literally all over the place the only project i wasn't working on was maybe projects that has to do with um a totally different thing but that was also something we were doing in our lab it was a totally different field that has to do with xenon gas uh, but every other project in my lab i was involved in and because i was involved in it it looks like um you are much more productive because once you are involved in another people's projects and they are gonna publish then you are gonna be on the paper you are gonna be um, a co-author and so it increases your productivity and probably it also lead to you having a lot of citations and not only that if we see that okay we want to work on something that we saw in literature my advisor would just tell me to shoot an email to them and see how we can do this together and usually sometimes they will not reply because i'm an unknown person but he will say that if they don't reply i should let him know and if they don't reply i'll let him know and he will shoot the email usually he will know that person because it's most of the research fields and even though they they look big but the professors know each other mm -hmm. yeah and so if you just choose the email to the pi of that lab then a collaboration is born and instead of us doing everything on our own sometimes we even make samples and send it to them let them do part of it for us send it back then we continue or sometimes we would even sponsor one person in our lab to go there. Or mm -hmm. most of the times they come to our lab because we have very much more sophisticated equipment that we build. So we tell them, we invite them to come, let them help us do this or come, let us teach you how to do this. And most of the time, something good comes out of it because usually when there's a visitor, you're working on some short timeline. So you are more focused and you bring storm, storm more and then things are just much more efficient and by the time they are done with the visit you have something that you can write a paper or a story about even if they are not done but you would have done a major part of it and so this really helped in um having ending up on a lot of papers because you not only contributed to it but you also just uh, probably wrote part of it or helped in the writing up or review of the paper before you submitted it to the journal or something. So I think this is something very important and I it also would depend on your advisor. Some advisors are not really collaborative, but you have to try to steer them in that direction and see. How do you how do you do that? So like um the other day I just went to my advisor's office and then I said that well I see that um some people from Duke University, they have come up with a pulse sequence that they can use to double polarization. And we are, we are interested in polarization in our lab. They, they have a pulse sequence that they can use to double it. How do we do it over here? I don't know how to do it. He said, okay, did you say Duke? And I said, yes. And he was like, well, I know. Who is that? Warren, Warren. I said, yeah. He said, shoot an email to him. I shoot a short an email. Uh -huh. Warren, Warren did not, did not reply. He sent an email and said, well, my students wants to talk to your students, which is Shannon. And then he wants to talk to, to her about this experiment that he wants to do. Then the PI over there forwarded the message to his students, which was Shannon. And then Shannon replied, well, this is what you do. This is what you do. And I was like, well, what do we use to do that? And then she gave us all the list of the things we need to buy, the materials, the supplies, and all of them. We bought it and things just went on from there. Like if we needed some simulations, she would do it to us, send it to us. So all I needed to, like I said from earlier on, it's just about communicating with your advisor. Mm -hmm. I just went in and told him that let's try this because this is our aim. And some people have done something like this. If this is really our aim and things are not working for us right now, can we try what they are doing or can we apply their method to what we are doing? And it's as simple as that and perhaps if your advisor is really wants the progress of the project or something he's just gonna say well okay let's talk to them and see or reach out to them and see what happens things can move on from there yeah all right that's that's really nice to hear about that you really need to um 
kind of be collaborative in your research. Even yeah. if there is no um, option like that in your lab, you can instigate that by encouraging your professor to collaborate with other people who have yeah. expertise in the areas that yeah. you guys lack in. And, and what's even interesting is that mm -hmm. now, if you want an academia job, for example, or even industry, they want to see that you've demonstrated some level of collaboration, collaboration and teamwork. In, the, in academic jobs, they will literally just ask you a question like, tell us a situation where you had to uh, uh, you had to do a collaboration that and how did it impact the output of whatever you were working on in industry interviews they will ask you situation where you had to lead a team you had to be part of a team and then maybe you were the draw like everything depended on you or everything depended on others doing something but they were not doing it how did you handle it they want to see how you work with others so <laughs> These are things that I think that every supervisor would not, I mean, any supervisor who is serious about your progress or your developments will not try to impede by saying, okay, don't collaborate or don't, unless you have too much on your hand that you are not doing anything like you yourself, you are not progressing. And it's not because of lack of um, expertise. expertise but yeah. So I think it wouldn't be bad. It wouldn't be bad to just ask. Well, let's collaborate with these people on this project and see what happens. Great. That's, that's really nice to hear. So, I mean, other things that I want to ask about is um, in terms of resources that or support systems that you used during your um, your grad school. It could be just, let's say, applications that were very useful for you um, in, in, in your research or in your coursework or maybe could even be the university resources that were very instrumental for you doing your research? Uh, I would say, I mean, I would say maybe the professional organizations I joined. I mean, even though I, I didn't really personally contribute to these organizations, they really helped me. So in my place, for example, there's in our department, there's no BJ, and it's about it's an organization for I think black chemists and engineers. And they once in a while they send out these resources. They have mentorship programs. Um, like they pay you with mentors in industry or academia. And I I happened to end up like I was very lucky to end up with an industrial mentor who is at um, like a manager at Vertex Pharmaceuticals, and up till now, I'm still talking to him and he advises me all the time. And he will say things like, oh, if you're applying to this company and then just tell me if I know someone there, I'll just talk to that person. And I think he has, he helped me prepare my CV and he gave me mock interviews, like how, what the questions he asks uh, applicants to their jobs at their company and all of that. And um, I think, um, Apart from that, yeah, apart from that, it's um, many other people I just met inside this organization. They were helpful in terms of just advice, how to, to just make things smoother for you. I mean, maybe these organizations, uh, it's not just, organi I mean, I'm just saying maybe networking in general, mm -hmm. like just connecting with people right. around because, I mean, everyone, I mean, everyone is maybe focused on their research, but people also have lives outside the research. Mm -hmm. And then some of these people are going to complete before you, you are going to complete before some of them. And so just connecting with them, it, it helps in some way. So I think these um, organizations, and then once in a while, any, any, anything that I see that has to do with, let's say, it has to do with graduate students and money comes out of it. So for example, there's going to be a symposium and they are going to be giving money or something i'm going to apply for it and what i found was that most people do not really read emails that have been sent by maybe the department information services or even the graduate school but sometimes they just send these things to us uh, that are beneficial to us so if i read and then i see that okay this is an advantage for a graduate student i read all of them i'm not gonna lie i read all of those messages and 
yeah over the years it's it has it has helped me because i just apply for some of these things that they just send out randomly and then mm -hmm. i win something and uh it adds up to my cv or maybe my self-confidence so i think um, yeah looking for things informational resources from just organizations networking organizations around it's very important helping your um and maybe not just your graduate school life but also your professional development mm -hmm. right so you mentioned things like joining organizations which are um in your graduate school you mentioned the fact that you have to also talk to and network with people that you're in the graduate school with attend symposia read email sent by you know um your department chairs from your graduate school because okay. there's usually actually most um a lot of good resources for graduate students um on these emails but sometimes because we are really busy we don't yeah. take time to read them um was it like a program or was it like a like a competition right mm -hmm. you were on a competition that came together to solve a problem in Wednesday. oh yeah yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah. where you actually yeah got those things from, yeah right? yeah so. yeah so they just send an email that's well Wayne State has a sustainability competition so and all students uh, especially graduate students are encouraged to apply and solve some problems and win some money so I applied I got in and I was I got paired up with graduate students from other departments business and communication and we ended up coming second we got some money yeah right and not just that I think I've uh, there was another one it was just an email about DuPont having some program they were having a personal statement competition I just entered and I can't believe it nationwide I was selected the winner and I got the money yeah and I guess the only the I mean the caveat was just that I just read the emails and then I, I went in for the opportunity yeah right so there was nothing really special about what you probably even wrote mm -hmm. you just read emails applied to stuff that um that way yeah. around right yeah I mean about that too I mean I know there's usually a lot of um basically there's a lot of jobs in terms of internships right and co-ops well can you speak on that because i know you've actually done an internship at intel before right can you speak on how you went about applying to these um jobs and where did you find these jobs and would you advise a first year or a second year student to apply to internships you have to you have to actually look at most of these big corporations they have an internship program they have intention programs mm -hmm. for students both okay. undergrads and graduate students mm -hmm. so and even if they don't if you go to their website and you don't see internship or early career opportunities you, and you just click on contact us and then you ask for it more most time most more more likely than not they are going to give you a favorable response at least and like those companies that don't put it on their website probably they are they it's not something they have in the pipeline but just by writing to them can give you an opportunity to come and work with them like just to learn something and the way i went about it was just to go on the corporate website and then i go and look for internship opportunities they usually would have it in the job sections and then i just apply I don't get it. I keep on applying. And How many did you apply? I would say I applied to, like, say, probably 15, 15 of them before I got a, a favorable response. And the 15 I ran across, I think, um, three companies. I think for even one company, I, I applied for more than 10 positions before I got a favorable response from them. And, um, I mean, you just move on from there because, and I would say that it is good to do this maybe when you are in your year, your completion, maybe in the fourth year or final year, because then they are more likely to offer you a full-time position mm -hmm. because you've just worked with them and you're about to finish. Like it's, it will be an, a missed opportunity for them to just let you go like that. So it would be nice to just do it while you are, when you are just about to finish your studies in grad school. 
I mean, you can also do it in, in third year, second year, but the question is, would your advisor allow you to do it at that time? Because if you do it at that time, he will not allow you to do it again because it looks like it's going to take out some time you are going to spend in the lab doing your own research. So I would say the best time to do it was to just wait till your fourth year or final year, and then you go for it. And once you're about to finish, instead of just walking away, maybe in the middle of the intensive, just talk to your manager or whoever is in charge of you. What are the opportunities to come back here and work? Is it possible? More often than not, they are going to be like, okay, let's look into it for you. And you, who knows, you are going to have um, a job waiting for you before you complete your studies. Yeah. Because that, that has been my experience so far. Yeah. All right. That's, that's really nice to hear about. So we are getting closer to the end of our discussion. Um, but before we go, I want you to talk about something that I do think even myself, I've actually struggled a lot with, and that has to do with time management and work-life balance, right? How do you think a first-year student or someone who is now entering into academia, for instance, should learn or to practice how to balance their time and also include some kind of balance between work and, and um, their, yeah, their um, personal lives? Well, I would say I am not, I'm not very good at um, balancing work and life, but I think that the most helpful thing ever to have happened to me was just calendars and just make up my mind that once this is the next on my calendar, I'm leaving everything. I'm just gonna forget about everything and do it now once you have this nailed down that times that you don't have anything on your calendar you are also just gonna make up your mind that that time is for you and you are using it for yourself and do whatever you want i uh, spend that time on your phone pressing or just lying down and, and sleeping but apart from that i i think that for just starting first year in the graduate school i mean the best the best you can do is to just the calendar the best <laughs> the best that could help i would say is just to make a calendar and when you wake up you know that this to, for today these are the things i'm going to do mm -hmm. and that's it just follow it through no matter what no procrastination i mean it's easier said than done but one thing that uh, really changed for me i i like to proc procrastinate a lot because I get a lot done when I know that there is pressure on me and then the deadline is near. But how I changed this was to just say that, okay, I don't want to do that thing, whatever I'm going to do. Because I think I have something in my mind about perfection. So I feel like because if I'm doing it right now, I'm not in the mood, I may not do it perfectly. So I will just keep on postponing. So what I did to change that was to just say, okay, whatever it is, even if it is worse, the worst form or whatever, just just do something about that thing. So if it's if I'm, I'm going to be writing, but I'm just procrastinating, I will just open up my laptop. Even if I'm writing one word, one word per minute or one letter per minute, I I I consider that as progress. I mean that means that when I do get in the mood, I won't have to write that one word again. So, but most times I realize that just doing it nonchalantly i just fall in the mood so i just decided to do it right away so more or less like you start the action yeah you get a momentum and you continue yes right? yes so i just trick myself into getting motivated to do it that's i mean it's it's helped me at a certain point but i was just getting things done nowadays i'm falling back to my old habits but i'm about to i'm writing my thesis now and i see that it's really helping me again i just my thing is Whatever it is, and sometimes even if I don't want to write on my computer, I will just take my phone and open my notes and then write whatever is coming to my mind about my project. And by the time I know, I will just be like, well, let me write this on my computer because the is, information is just coming, All right? All right. Okay. So, I mean, talking about like how you said calendars are one of the most important transformative tools for you. As a graduate student, how do you typically, you know, arrange stuff on your calendar? Do you have like, you know, a time within the week where you plan out your day? Do you plan out your week? 
why how do you put tabs on let's say you're giving work by your professor to do how do you put them in your calendar or and then how do you manage it such that you are able to follow what's in your calendar yeah so i just i just um i just make sure that um have everything so if it's repetitive then it's just plan out for the week i know this is like for, teaching. yeah like uh, every week you are going to teach on this day so that one is automatic you know it's every week your phone is going to remind you but for the things that are contingent so like you just talk to your advisor and then you're supposed to do this something i would just while we are just deciding that well on wednesday let's do this at this time i'll just ask at what time then he'll say it i'll put it and enter it in the calendar and just save it you ask for deadlines yeah yep and most if it if it's to do with my advisor for example i would always i always set me with the deadline before the day before he wants it okay because otherwise maybe my procrastination behavior will just kick in and i'll wait all day so i'll just usually will set the day before the deadline mm-hmm. that's the day i'm supposed to um have that goal achieved once i have it if I really do complete it by that date, I'm going to try to submit it or return it in. If it's a meeting, well, then I'm putting the right time there. But if it's something I'm supposed to do by a certain date, I set a day before or it's some time before. And so that if I just finish, I'll let him know. Then he will be like, oh, okay, you, you already did it. Well, then let's have a look. Or no, let's stick to the time I planned with you. And that's, that's it. Yeah. It's that's really useful to know. Um, another thing that I also want to ask about is, did you ever feel imposter syndrome during your graduate school? Okay, so imposter syndrome is like basically like most graduate students feeling like okay, they are inadequate, or like they think they are not good enough to be here. And I think the best solution. So that is two things. One is to recognize that like most of the time you feel that way because you are comparing yourself to people who are already experts mm-hmm. in the field or they've been there for some time. Right. And the other thing is because you don't know. Okay. And so to console myself, I say, well, this person, I'll probably be better than them if I spend that much time that they've spent. So then well, you spend that much time. Exactly. So then I start, I will just put on my effort. Like I said earlier on, when I get obsessed with a subject, I will read about it on Wikipedia or go to YouTube. And that's how I get things stuck in my mind. And sometimes some of these don't even have YouTube things to look on. But everywhere I'll get material on it, I'll start, I'll keep on looking at it. And then I'll start now posting on it on social media like I'm the only person who know about it. By the time I realize, well, I own it but yeah most of the time I just say that well this they know this because they spend more time on it and if I spend that equivalent amount of, amount of time I'm also going to be good as good as them so and other, the other thing is that people are just specialists in their field probably if you just wherever that you are listening to if you just go a little bit away from what they are talking about they don't know anything so you just have to give yourself some time to also come around that's all great so you're moving to the last end of our talk Mm -hmm. but we want to know as a community um what are your future plans what are your plans in terms of um as you're graduating from graduate school so i'm gonna be in the industry i just I just want to work for some time, save some money, and um, I have some ideas I want to work on, but I, I can't work on them with that money. So just get some money from industry and try to implement my ideas and see if it works. But the ultimate, ultimately, I actually want to go back home, but I don't want to go back home empty-handed or go back home and have to go scrambling and looking for a job from someone and not getting so. I want to make sure that I just get into industry, set up myself in a way that I can survive or start my, put my ideas in action and then I'm, I'm out. But 
as for science, it will always be there. We will always come back to it. So, last question. What are your final thoughts for, um, or final words for the new people who are coming to grad school and also people who are in grad school who want to accomplish a lot? So, just give us a summary of the whole um, conversation. Okay, so I would say one, I mean, maybe I didn't know this before. Uh, maybe I've, I'm, I'm just now discovering it. Uh, after the fact, I would say one, just have the the singular mind because you know why you come here, like travel several kilometers. Or I mean, for those who are international students and for those who are not international students, I mean, you still left some things. You could have gone and do a lot of things, but you decided to come to to a PhD or a master's. Mm -hmm. So just have the singular goal. In this number of years, if it's a master's, two years. I want to get out with this number of papers or with this accomplishment so I can move on to this. And so just have that in mind. This is what I want to do and how do I do it? And this would either happen or not based on the advice that you end up with. And so you should choose keep, your mind, keep that in mind and choose a good advisor and just also work as expected i know um for example for some of us who are even africans or black students we may feel like oh okay uh maybe maybe they are just being nice or maybe they consider me because i'm black so you have to make sure that you you prove that not true so you put in all your efforts and actually do real work and I guess no matter what people say here, that there's discrimination, there's this and all of that, if you still are just good, people cannot ignore you forever. So eventually things are going to work out in your favor. So I would just say, yep, your eye on the ball, which is came here to get your PhD. So how do you get it? And what do you do after that? If you wanna go to industry or academia, your choice so i i i i don't think i really know much now because i mean i'm not grad i've not graduated yet that's just what i think <laughs> just that's what i think you should do because this is just something i learned in hindsight if i was gonna start again i would just this is what i would just do focus i want to get this number of people maybe every year i have a target of one paper that i want to publish and I'm going to put all my energy into that. And at the end of my PhD or towards the end of my PhD, I want to do a, an internship or I don't, even if you don't want to do an internship, I want to work with this company. So I will now be arranging everything in my graduate school around that fact because you know you want to go to industry. So you try to learn about equipmentation as much as you can. And if you want to stay in academia, then you try to involve yourself in all sorts of extracurricular leadership things like and even this diversity stuff because nowadays they require it if you want to be in the academy you have to write diversity and inclusion statements and all of that so you actually just involve yourself in all of that and it prepares you eventually instead of waiting so maybe third year or fourth year and then you start figuring these things out another thing that i would say finally is that don't wait till your final year to look for jobs you should start looking for your job in when you are in your fourth year because then there's not pressure on you but when you are just about to finish in the next six months in the next five months then you start looking there's a lot of pressure and you may not have the time to put in good applications to your uh to, to your potential employers so basically that's it for me all right yeah thank you mr shiraz thank Toma, for coming to um our you are welcome you are and welcome. That will be all for this edition, uh, this episode of Couch Talk, and I believe I'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.